Well, good afternoon, it's Charlie ZL2 CTM. Um, there was a common uh, comment made, and quite rightly so, uh, in the last video that um, it might be useful for me to um, to explain a little bit more some of the formulas that are being used um, to help others to, to understand. Um, caveats there, um, I'm not an electrical engineer um, teacher or professor, I think. Uh, so you know, what I'm about to say um, is certainly not an exhaustive um, look at the formulas uh, and, and, and more than likely probably a few uh, inaccuracies here and there. So um, with that caveat, we'll move on. So what I wanted to do was just sort of um, use, I guess, what we presented um, in the last video as a bit of a basis and then sort of just build on that to talk sort of generically about say some inductance, some capacitance, um, uh, power, uh, DBM uh, and the like. So, so hopefully at the end of the video, um, and for those who know all this, please just switch it off. Um, there's no need to watch this. It's all going to be sort of um, fundamental formulas. Um, hopefully by the end of the video, um, there might be a little bit greater understanding um, of some of the calculations that get used, not only on the, um, this particular project, but also in regards to the radios and, and amplifiers and the like. So um, I'm just going to set this aside for now and uh, I'll come back later on just to double check that um, we have indeed covered everything off. So the first thing I wanted to sort of touch on is, is power. So um, I, I'm not going to get into an exhaustive discussion about what power is and what it means, um, but I'll sort of just sort of cut to the chase and, and talk about if we were to have a resistor and we had a voltage across it, um, and that was a DC voltage, then we could say that power equals V squared over R in ohms. If there's now a current passing through that um, resistor, then we could say power is also equal to I squared R. Now, just switching back to voltage, um, many of the radio or many of the circuits we're playing with here uh, have got alternating or it's it's an AC signal and not a DC. So you've got the old resistor here, um, we've got the, uh, the, the oscilloscope probe sitting over that and we see on the oscilloscope a sine wave. So in order to, um, and we saw this in the, in the last video so I want to cover it off, uh, in order to work out what the power is across that resistor or it's being dissipated more the point in that um, resistor, we need to convert the sine wave that we're reading here with some kind of voltage peak to peak um, into the equivalent of our VDC. So to do that, first things first, so our voltage peak to peak, we're going to divide it in half and just get rid of one half, so divided by two. And then there's a value there, which is the equivalent um, when, when it's going through a resistor, that level there is the equivalent of voltage DC and that is 0 0.7071. So if we were to do that calculation there, so our voltage peak to peak divided by 2, get rid of that, multiply it by 0 0.7071, we'll get rid of that, and we're just left with this portion here. So if that was now squared, and then we divided that by our resistor, we've now got our power, the power being dissipated um, on that resistor there. Um, yeah, so full stop. Now, something was mentioned before, uh, certainly in the last video, was referencing a power. So that's, that power is in some kind of watts. Uh, referencing it to say one milliwatt to, to convert that into a dBm value. And you'll see dBms used all over the place. Uh, transmitters, receivers, um, as we saw last week, or the last video I should say, the 8307. Um, its input levels were uh, defined in terms of dBm. So all dBm is, uh, it's nothing special, it's just rather than just having a power, we're now going to reference it to a reference level. And because it's a little m there, dBm, it's 1 milliwatt. So 1 milliwatt or uh, 1 times 10 to the power of negative 3 watts. So now, so, so now um, to convert or to create this dBm value here, all we have to do, let's make sure that's still in view there, is, is go 10 log, whatever our power is in watts, divided by 1 times 10 to the power of negative 3, 
and that will give us dBm. So let's um, let's give that a go. Um, let's go with say uh, two milliwatts, and we're going to reference that to our one milliwatt. And like I say, ten log that. So it's punched in the old calculator there. So let's go with uh, so we'll two milliwatts divided by one milliwatt um, is straight away two. So we don't need to do anything special there. So two log ten times should come out with three. So three dBm. So that's what our 2 milliwatts is, reference to 1 milliwatt is, is the equivalent of 3 dBm. Now, this reminds me of this 3 dB here, reminds me of something. Um, when we've got um, power, and we we're looking at, say, an amplifier, and we've got, and we'll just keep things nice and simple here, uh, 1 watt going in, and we get 2 watts going out, we can express the gain of this um, amplifier here uh, one of two ways um, or the way I'll do for a start is in regards to power so the power gain for this amplifier is 10 log power out over power in and it'll give us our, our power out over power in so that just happens to be um, 10 log 2 divided by 1 so 2 divided by 1 equals 2 funny old thing um, 2 log as we just did before times 10 so I'll do it again so 2 log, and then multiply that by 10, is 3 dB. Now in this particular case, I am not going to use dBm, because this is just a straight ratio. It's a ratio of powers. I'm not referencing anything to a particular level. In this particular case up here, I had referenced our 2 milliwatts to 1 milliwatt. So therefore I could use that extension, the little m there for dBm. In this particular case, it's just purely a ratio of powers, across this amplifier. Now what I wanted to talk about was the 3 dB. 3 dB um, is well, sort of those sort of, not magical, but it's a figure you'll see often um, meeting essentially two times. So we have doubled our power. So two times one equals two, which just turns out to be in terms of dB, 3 dB. So you'll hear 3 dB being mentioned many, many times. And conversely, minus 3 dB is a half. So we can prove that, so let's have uh, 10 log, 1 watt going in, and half a watt coming out. So we've halved our power coming out. So it's not a very good amplifier. Uh, it's now an attenuator. So let's just do that. So 1 divided by 0.5. So 0.5 gives us 2 log 10 times. is 3. But what I should have done is, because I'm an idiot, um, I should have gone 0 0.5 divided by 1. So there you go. That's just me um, talking out loud here without actually thinking. So power out was our half a watt versus our 1 watt going in. So that should be now become a negative when I do it. So 0 0.5 divided by 1 equals 0 0.5. Um, log that. And then 10 times, funny old thing, now we have our minus 3 dB. So um, I did it on purpose just for um, the education not. Right, so um, so that's that's one way of expressing uh, the gain of an amplifier by means of power. Now if for example, I hope that's still in view there, you've got that same amplifier and you say put one volt in and you got two volts out, as long as you're in the same units you can express uh, that amplifier in terms of gain, so you get the same gain value, but this time you have to go 20 log, so not 10, so 20 log V out over V in. So in this particular case, um, we will go to go 2 volts versus 1 volt, so 2 divided by 1 equals 2 log 20 times, we're going to come out with a value of 6 dB. 6 dB. So that amplifier is a gain of 6 dB. Now, 6 dB is again one of those sort of magical numbers you see floating around. Not magical, but you know, like I say, you'll see it often used because you've now doubled the voltage. So if you've got an amplifier that doubles voltage or, or any kind of doubling of um, voltages, it's the equivalent of 6 dB. It's a 6 dB change. Conversely, if that was 1 volt in, and we got 0 0.5 volts out, so in other words we've halved our voltage, this time I'll do it correctly, so 0.5 divided by 1 equals 0.5, 
log 20 times comes out at minus 6. So what we'd expect, minus 6 dB for a halving of our voltage. Um, so yeah. Now, why is it useful to express, say, amplifiers or um, filters, for example, minus 6 dB? Um, yeah, it's pretty bad, but you know, minus 6 because it's going to be some kind of, it's a, it's a passive device, it's, it's consuming energy, it's not creating it, so therefore it's going to have some kind of losses. But bottom line is, why is it useful to use dB? Well, it's quite useful because you can then just do straight out, some straight out, um, sorry, I'm trying to double check that was still on the view there, straight out math. So if you had, for example, uh, an antenna amplifier coming in off the antenna, and that has had, say, 10 dB, we were going through some kind of filter, minus 3 dB, going into another amplifier with some sort of ton of gain, 20 dB, etc, 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 then we can just go simply, um, in terms of just straight out gain from here to here, we would go plus 10, minus 3, plus 20, um, equals, what's that, 27, isn't it? Um, so 10 minus 3 equals 7, plus 20 equals 27 dB. Now the beauty of, of playing this game, and we saw this in uh, last the last videos, if we convert our power to a dBm, in other words, we'd reference it to 1 milliwatt, if we were to say here we had coming in here um, 1, say again, um, 1 dBm, just for interest sake. Then we could say 1 dBm plus 10 minus 3 plus 20 equals 28. Um, so 1 plus 27 equals 28 dBm. I think my math is right there. So we, we, we're allowed to keep the m there as opposed to up here because we have put in not just it's not no, no longer just a ratio of powers between this point and this point it is now an actual uh, level because we've referenced a power to one milliwatt so we can keep the dbm there so that's quite useful once you convert things to dbm and like i say that's exactly what we saw in that last um, video where we had said that our 8307 had a maximum input allowed of 10 dbm and the output of this um, coupler um, was across a 50 ohm load, which we had two 100 ohm resistors in parallel, was the equivalent of 25 dBm when we referenced it. Um, when we referenced it to up here, one milliwatt. So that was our power across the 50 ohm resistor. Uh, we then referenced that to our one milliwatt, so our 10 log that power divided by one milliwatt came out at approximately 25 dBm. So that's where we can now just play this game of maths here. So we've got 25 dBm at, at uh, dBm at this point, and we want to get down to um, no more than 10 dBm at this point, so therefore we need to put it through some kind of pad. And that's what we're discussing. We want to attenuate, so we just, it's going to have some kind of negative value on it, because so we want to go. So 25 minus, and we were talking about initially 15, would bring us down to 10, but if we sort of add another 5 dB to 20, it would be 25 minus 20 comes to 5. So if we made that a 20 dB pad, 25 dBm minus 20 dB, because it's a ratio of power between these two points, would give us um, 5 dBm um, at this point. And therefore we could then compare that directly back to our spec sheet, which was referenced in dBm's. I hope that made sense. Right, so let's draw a line under that. So that was a, uh, a brief romp through um, power in terms of uh, calculating power with voltage, um, the conversion of peak to peak to our equivalent um, VDC, or, or in other words, VRMS, root mean squared for a, uh, an alternating um, current signal. Um, we talked about current. Um, and then conversions of uh, those to, to dBm. Right, so the, the other thing that's come up a few times is uh, inductive and capacitive reactants. So XL and XC. Um, 
And I just wanted to sort of briefly touch on that, um, just, to, just to sort of, I guess, talk briefly about it. So XL equals 2 pi FL. So 2 pi, that's a, that's a fixed, you know, that's a, that's a constant. Um, frequency of operation in megahertz, and sorry again, in hertz. And our inductance in henrys. So, um, as we know, an inductor, its its role in life is to uh, is to impede through its inductive reactants any kind of variations in current. So, if we were okay, right, full stop. Now, L um, equals uh, n squared uh, mu a over L. So, and a so n squared uh, so it's a mu o mu r. Um, a over L should be for a um, for a, uh, a uh, an inductor such as this. So if for whatever reason we had an inductor like this, and we wanted to be able to manipulate our inductive reactants, effectively we've got two variables we can play with. We can play with frequency. We can play with inductance. And if we were to say, well, our frequency of operation in this particular circuit, it's an oscillator. It's fixed. Um, that's a gimme. So we can't vary that. So therefore, all we can play around with is our inductance. Um, and if you were, if you did have, say, an inductor like this, then um, the variables here we can play around with. So mu o is, is uh, four pi times ten to the power of negative seven. Our mu r, our, um, our relative permeability, um, is the core material. In this particular case, the core is air. So our mu r would be approximately equal to one, or we would use one. And then our air, so, uh, sorry, not air, our A is our area. So that's that, that area looking down there in millimetres squared. Uh, was it metres squared? Ah, oh, whatever, area. Double check that one. Um, and then L is the overall length of the, um, the inductor in this particular case. So you can see there, if we were to squeeze this up and therefore make L smaller, our, induct, our, our inductance would increase. Conversely, if we were to reduce our area and make it much, much smaller, so if that was to go down, then our inductance would go down because it's directly proportional. So inductance is proportional to area, and it's um, proportional to 1 over L. Um, so just wanted to cover that one off. Um, I don't particularly use many of these types of inductors, but um, it's just more just having a, look at, a quick look at the formula. The other thing we have uh, is uh, capacitance or capacitive reactants. That one comes up quite often uh, in regards to making sure that for our particular amplifiers, for example, our coupling capacitors coming in and going out, or say it's a BJT and we have our uh, emitter resistor and we want to work out what the um, capacitive reactance is for the bypass or the, decoup uh, the, the bypass capacitor. Therefore, we need to use uh, XC equals 1 over. 2 pi Fc. So it's a little bit different from our uh, inductive reactance formula because we're now 1 over. So in other words, it's um, our capacitive reactance is inversely proportional, so 1 over, to frequency and um, capacitance. These are gimmies, they're fixed, 2 pi. So if frequency was to increase, then because it's 1 over, our Xc would decrease. If C was to increase, Again, our XC was to decrease. Um, now, for example, here goes just a, uh, a variable capacitor. It's a parallel plate capacitor because it's made up of parallel plates. Um, and if we were just to, for interest sake, have a quick look at um, that formula, then we would have um, capacitance equals uh, EO, ER, A, uh, N minus 1 over D. Yeah, it should be D. Right. So we're now into permittivities, uh, 8.854 times 10 to the power of negative 12, that's fixed. Um, that's our relative permittivity of the core. In this particular case, we've got an air core capacitor, so that equals 1. For all intents and purposes, it's, it's fixed, uh, certainly in this particular design here. Uh, and then we've got our area, our number of plates we've got there. We're always, just, in terms of the calculation, just 1 minus the total number. Uh, and then D is the distance uh, between the plates. So you can see here straight away uh, how a variable capacitor such as this works in regards to the formula. We can see that 
the distance is fixed. It, we can't vary the distance there, so that's that's a fixed value. The number of plates is fixed, so we've got one through wherever it is, 20 let's say, 20, 20, one, 20 minus one is 19, but either way, it's fixed. Um, I'm not gonna try and pull this apart mechanically to change the, uh, the capacitance. So the only variable we've got left is area. So as you can see here, uh, if you look down here, that's the that's the area we're talking about. Um, when it's fully meshed, therefore all of the area is, or A is maximized, more the point. So therefore maximum A equals maximum capacitance. If we're now to move it across, the area that's meshed, because we're only concerned about the areas that meshed in regards to this formula, the area that's unmeshed for all intents and purposes doesn't really play into that formula, all the way around here to our minimum value, where we have minimum A. There will still be some capacitance between the input and the output, but for all intents and purposes, that's uh, our A is at its minimum value as opposed to the maximum value at that point. Um, and in terms of that plate distance here, that's why you see for those big high power uh, transmitters, um, you know, the, the big antenna tuners with, the, with, with the lots of power, that these plates are spaced quite quite widely apart. Um, and the reason there is for, um, if you were to have the plates very, very close together, um, the worry is as frequency increases, our capacitive reactants decreases, and then we run the risk of some kind of high voltage point um, being shorted, either to earth or between, uh, between stages or whatever. So in other words, another, another way of, of reducing, um, or more the point, increasing the capacitive reactance and uh, any kind of flashover is to, uh, is to increase the D. I'm pretty sure that's the uh, main logic for that one. Um, and of course, increasing D then changes your, 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 um, changes your capacitance calculations, so that needs to be taken into consideration too. Okay, so I guess sort of summarising and just coming back to making sure that we're sort of covered off on, on what we discussed in the last video, hopefully we did. Um, for this particular one, I, I'm not going to talk about um, transformer ratios, um, but we did talk about, uh, in, in previous videos, um, turns ratio and the like. But here we here goes our inductive reactants, our 2 pi FL, um, and we said that we wanted to have three times 50, so 150 ohms, so we just plug that straight into there, so 150 equals 2 pi, we said our frequency of operation was 3.5 megahertz times L. In other words, L now equals, if we were to rearrange and put all this on the other side, 150 divided by 2 pi, 3.5 times 10 to the power of 6 times, uh, yeah, that's it. Worked that out, and then it came out with our value of L. So that's yeah, that's why it's quite useful to certainly know that formula. Um, I talked about um, wanting to keep the, the the distance between the transformer and the and the sides quite large. Uh, so you know, I've got arguably a box which is probably too big for it, but hey, it's it's the one I had available, so I was quite happy to do that. So again, you know, the thinking there was we go back to um, our, here we have it, uh, sorry, a bit of paper all over the place, here it is here. If we were to go back to our um, capacitance formula, then by increasing D, I was reducing our straight capacitance, or the capacitance between that transformer and um, and the parallel plate, this again, the, the outside case so that was the reason why if I was trying to increase D to reduce that. Do, 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 do. Um, so we talked about the layout. Um, right, so going back through these values here, um, in, in each case I, um, I had sitting across both the forward and the reverse port uh, two parallel 100 ohm resistors, which gave 50 ohms. So what I was doing there, I was then converting um, the voltages and these were V peak to peak. I was converting those into VRMS to work out what the power was. And that's exactly what we see here. So, hopefully it's all in view there. Um, our four volts peak to peak divided by two, 
multiplied by 0.7071, all squared, divided by 50 ohms, gives me a power. So that was the power that I was dissipating in that um, particular resistor. Um, um, right to do, so there goes those values. Uh, here goes some conversions here. So we're now converting um, what were the two powers. In this particular case, at 7.1 megahertz, we had uh, 6.72 milliwatts on the Ford port. So I'm now going to reference that to one milliwatt. So 6.72 milliwatts, so got to make sure the units are the same, so in other words, in watts. Um, so 6.72 times 10 to the power of negative 3 divided by 1 times 10 to the power of negative 3, they cancel. 10 log 6.72 comes out at 8.3 dBm. So I can now use the little M um, uh, symbol there or subscript, or not subscript, but yeah, the moniker, uh, because I've referenced it to 1 milliwatt. Why was that useful? Because um, I think I've just mentioned, I've, sort of what I've talked about now, we wanted to make sure that we weren't going to um, exceed uh, either the high power port or the forward port or our reflected port. We weren't going to exceed the maximum amount, uh, allowable limit and we wanted to make sure that we were going to be greater than the um, the other end of the scale. So we actually want to be able to be detected because we had said that the most linear range for the 8307 was minus 65 to plus 10 uh, dBms. So that's the reason why we had converted those to dBms. And it also allowed us to, um, and did I draw the picture of that? Uh, no, I didn't. It also allowed us to then um, say that, well, we had 25 dBm coming from our forward port at 45 watts. And the 8307 had a maximum that I was going to say allowable power going into it in terms of dBm of 10 dBm. So straight away that is greater than that, not good. We risk, the chip, we risk burning out our, our AD 8307. So therefore we had to introduce some kind of attenuator to, to knock that down to get below that allowable level there. So that's why we had 25 dBm going into some kind of pad, or well, a resistive pad it's going to be, and we want to have an output of no greater than 10 dBm. And in those calculations we talked about, well strictly speaking, uh, a minus 15 dB. Now, it's a ratio of power in to power out, so I, I just talk in terms of dB here, I'm not talking to, in terms of dBm. So I want to be able to uh, have you know a minimum of 15, so 25 minus 15 equals 10. Why not bump that up to say minus 20? And, um, give us a bit of fat. So 25 minus 20, so now we're playing that addition game that we mentioned before, you know, when we had the um, different stages and we can just add stuff up. So now we've got 25 dBm minus 20 equals 5. And 5 dBm, why dBm? Because we threw a referenced power level going in, is less than 10, so now we're good. Um, there was a question uh, raised about in terms of that particular project, what would be required by way of a pad for, say, 150 watts going through the coupler? Um, I, I can't answer that right now. Um, I don't have, no, I don't have, I don't have a transmitter in here capable of delivering that. So I really don't know uh, what the power is going to be at the forward port um, for that particular power there, given the turns ratio. Uh, of 10 of uh, uh, 10 turns on the uh, two transformers uh, if I have time I'll look at if there's any other kind of ratio we can work out from these values here um, based on 5 watts is there some kind of um, you know, linear transfer function between um, power in and power at the uh, the forward port now, if there's a linear, linear relationship, then we should be able to extrapolate up to 150 to get that value there. Rightio, um, I'm going to say 73s there. Um, I'm now going to repeat um, my starting comments. You know, I'm not a professor in this in any way, shape or form. Um, no doubt there were errors and 